Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. Your gallbladder. It's a small pear-shaped organ on the right side of your abdomen, underneath your liver. You can't feel it. Don't okay. even try. All right. <laughs> the gallbladder stores fluid called bile that is released into your small intestine to aid digestion. Inflammation of the gallbladder is known as cholecystitis, itis meaning inflammation, and it can be caused by several different things. Gallstones blocking the tube leading out of the gallbladder can result in the buildup of bile, which is a frequent cause of inflammation. Other causes of an inflamed gallbladder can include problems with the bile duct itself, tumors, which can sometimes be cancerous, and even certain infections. Here to discuss gallbladder disease is Mayo Clinic gastroenterologist Dr. Brett Peterson. Welcome to the program, Dr. Peterson. It's nice to meet you. Thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to be here with you. Brett with one T. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> gastroenterologist. So you're a, a specialist, a subspecialist, and you work a lot with patients who have gallbladder disease. So tell us a little bit about the gallbladder, where it is, what it does. Well, the gallbladder is a recipient for bile coming out of the liver during periods of fasting and it expands and and the bile made by the liver which is being made all day long is stored there and concentrated a lot of water is sucked out of bile while it's there so uh, when you eat a meal the gallbladder squeezes a muscle at the bottom of the duct uh, relaxes and bile that's now very concentrated is expelled into the intestine to mix with your food for digestion what tells it to squeeze uh, there's a hormonal stimulus, and when food and thought uh, are <laughs> accompanied a, at the time of a meal, the, uh, and food arriving in the duodenum uh, tells it to squeeze. The duodenum is that little portion coming right out of the stomach. That's right, the upper small intestine. Well, what do you do if you don't have a gallbladder? Because if people have problems with it and it's removed, then what do they do? So... Um, the gallbladder is the most uh, removal of the gallbladder is the most common operation in America today. Uh, is that right? Much. And so even it's, over appendix, it's, a, it's a, yes, it's very very common to live without a gallbladder, perfectly uh, healthy lives. The bile that's important for our digestion then resides in part uh, in the bile duct during fasting, and in part it just uh, rests and is present within the entire length of the small bowel. The bile that's secreted and is in the small bowel is recycled by reabsorption in the lower small bowel and comes back through the bloodstream to the liver and goes through multiple cycles, losing just a little bit with each cycle into the large intestine. You know, it used to be when people would have their gallbladder out, I remember when I was a kid, uh, they would be in the hospital for two weeks. There would be a big incision. You remember the picture of Lyndon Baines Johnson showing sure. his gallbladder scar? And it seemed to me like people who had had their gallbladder out had to change their diet. But that's not true anymore, is it? Not particularly. No, that's correct. Digestion works fine with, without the gallbladder. The bile's still active and still functioning the way it should. The major consequence long-term of having your gallbladder out is a small proportion of patients develop uh, chronic diarrhea, maybe two or three percent, which is easily uh, managed with agents that bind the bile that's spilling into the colon. So it's the it's the bile uh, in the colon that causes the diarrhea, and, yeah. and what? And just a small percentage of people, though. Uh, in a small percentage, it's irritating and uh, stimulates. Uh, see. Uh, it uh, inhibits, it irritates the colon and inhibits absorption of the fluids in the intestine. So most folks, uh, if they have a little bit of softening, uh, it's, uh, don't appreciate it as a, as a major consequence, but this small percentage has enough diarrhea to require some intervention. But that's easily managed and a modest issue. What most commonly goes wrong with the gallbladder? Well, m most patients... Uh, who develop gallstones, which are underlie most problems in the gallbladder, uh, are asymptomatic, and most stones don't cause problems. If we look at uh, the entire population, somewhere around uh, five to eight percent of men will develop gallstones. Somewhere around ten to fifteen percent of women, so about twice as often in women, and eighty percent of those who do develop them are asymptomatic. We sometimes find them unexpectedly when looking for other things, but we just leave them alone and they do fine. Somewhere around 20% of patients will develop pain, we call biliary colic, and this is a, a very typical pain that comes on 
fairly abruptly over five to 15 minutes, sticks around for a prolonged interval of a half hour to several hours before resolving somewhat gradually. So a biliary colic, however, can then recur if it's developed once. So that's when we start to entertain intervention. A small portion of patients who've had biliary colic will go on to develop more serious complications of cholecystitis, where the pain persists, the gallbladder is very inflamed, and uh, removing it is um, less elective and more urgent. So I want to ask you about the risk factors for developing uh, gallstones. When I was in medical school, it was female, fat, 40, and fertile. Oh, my God. Right? Now, I don't know if you can still say that. Maybe they've changed the words, but is that still true? That's still true. We know women develop gallstones twice as often as men because of their milieu of estrogen and progestins in the bloodstream. We know that uh, certain ethnic groups develop uh, gallstones much more often. American uh, Indians, Native Americans, are the probably the highest prevalence of gallstones. Hispanic populations, fairly high. Caucasians, below that, and, and African Americans, uh, less than that even. So um, uh, ethnicity is important. Family history is very important, probably a twofold or threefold increase in, in likelihood of forming stones. Uh, overweight states, especially with the BMI over 30, the risk of gallstones is quite a bit higher. Um, and multiple others that are gradually less important. Fertility, the, the uh, fertile part, uh, having a pregnancy is a, a high risk factor for developing stones or gallbladder sludge, a precursor to stones. Uh, sludge often resolves after a pregnancy and stones tend to stick around. So if someone's had multiple pregnancies, their likelihood of stones is much higher. Is this mostly diagnosed because there's pain present? Is that what brings patients in? So most gallstones probably go undiagnosed, huh. um, but the uh, patients have all variety of symptoms that may or may not be related to stones. And then they're usually fairly easily diagnosed by ultrasound. So identification of stones is generally straightforward, except a small proportion with tiny, tiny stones. Um, but then the attribution of symptoms to the stones is sometimes a much more difficult issue. I can tell you that there are outliers, and I am one of them. <coughs> Female, fat, 40, and fertile, <laughs> and none you. of them, and I have my gallbladder out. And the, the pain is extreme. Uh, in fact, I was in the emergency room three times with the same similar <laughs> pain, and since I don't fit the bill for having gallbladder disease, <laughs> it took them a while to figure that out. But the good thing is you can take it out through the laparoscope. That's it's right. relatively simple, straightforward surgery. You're in, what, overnight? And uh, really, I didn't have to change my diet at all. So the, the surgery is absolutely remarkable. Are there other treatment options besides surgery? <laughs> well, other options have been developed uh, over many, many years, but with the advent of laparoscopic approaches to surgery, um, many of the other options became less realistic, uh, less cost-effective, um, less, uh, they're less effective uh, themselves. So um, cholecystectomy is really the only realistic option for the patient who can undergo surgery as a surgical candidate. All right, Dr. Brad Peterson, unfortunately, we didn't have time to talk about everything we wanted to, so we'll have you back sometime to talk about other gallbladder diseases, including uh, cancer of the gallbladder, which fortunately is not very common, but it can happen. All right. Well, good. We've hardly touched on uh, the topic. All right, Dr. Brett Peterson, gastroenterologist, talking about gallbladder disease. Thanks so much for being with us. All right. Thank you.